Hey there, I'm Pastor Luis Medrano, and we're going to continue on the series, The Life of Jesus Christ. Today we're going to focus on one of the most powerful figures in the history of the Bible, John the Baptist. The Bible says that he was a relative of Jesus Christ. We're going to look and see just how that might have been. And we have to begin this story in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Now we know that Mary had received a, a, a message from the angel Gabriel that she was going to give birth to a miraculous child. But six months prior to that, her relative Elizabeth uh, also received the same message, that she would give birth. Now the Bible tells us in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1 that Elizabeth, the relative of Mary, wife of Zechariah, um, that she was a righteous woman. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 1, verse 6, that both Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. The only issue was in verse 7, it says they had no child. Why? Because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now, when the Bible says that, that they were both advanced in years, it's telling us that Elizabeth is beyond childbearing age. So, we might make the assumption here that she's around 50 to 60 years old. We're not, we're not sure. It doesn't tell us exactly, but she was an older woman. And one of the things that we ought to know is that God was moving in a way that he had not moved for over 400 years. This is what I mean. The very last book in the Bible of the, oh, excuse me, in the Old Testament was the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi has four chapters and the last two verses of the book of Malachi chapter four has a prophecy, you might say, verses five and six. Listen as I read Malachi chapter four, verses five and six. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And so what God had promised in the Old Testament was that before the coming day of God, that he would send a herald, someone who would prepare the way for the arrival of God. And so God made that promise. And what's interesting to me is that as we look at Elizabeth and Zechariah, the promise is being fulfilled, but, but look how interesting God does it. When you think about the name Zechariah in Hebrew, um, you, you, you want to know what it, what it means. Um, for, for instance, Zechariah, the Hebrew name Zechariah means God remembers. And when you think about the name Elizabeth, um, the, the name Elizabeth in Hebrew means uh, the promise of God or, or God's promises or the oath of God. And so put these two together. Um, God remembers the oath of God or the promise of God, then you have this really neat reminder through the names of the parents of John the Baptist, God remembers his promises. What he promised in Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6 that he would send a herald. And so when we look here in Luke chapter 1, we find out that John the Baptist has come in the spirit spirit of Elijah. He will be a herald. He is going to be someone who, just like Elijah, is going to announce the coming of God. John the Baptist is going to announce someone who's very important. We know who that is, Jesus Christ. And um, this is where, the I, I believe in Latin, the word Adventus. This is why every December, for those of you who, who celebrate Advent, that's what it means. The name Advent means the arrival. And every year we're, we're celebrating the arrival or the coming soon uh, of, of Jesus Christ. And so John the Baptist was born to fulfill God's Old Testament promise and to prepare the way for the coming, the arrival of the Son of God. This is incredible stuff. So John the Baptist is in Elizabeth's womb and she is at the six month mark. And the scripture tells us in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1 verse 41 that when Elizabeth 
and Mary meet. Uh, uh, Mary has left uh, Nazareth because she's under a lot of stress and pressure and wants to be with someone who, by the way, Elizabeth is her relative, but I really believe that she is uh, Mary's aunt based on the age. I, I think it's better understood that, that Elizabeth was her aunt. Um, the Bible doesn't call her a cousin, it just calls her a relative. So you can agree to disagree, and, and I'm good with that. But as we move ahead, the Bible says that when they met, John, who is six months in Elizabeth's womb, verse 41 says that John jumps in Elizabeth's tummy. John recognized that Jesus was right there. So, the Bible says that the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, this, this is an amazing moment. Zechariah, uh, six months prior, he had gone to the temple to serve a, and, and to receive an incredible privilege. Uh, priests like Zechariah, uh, they could have a once in a lifetime opportunity to go into the temple, to go into the holy place and light incense. When Zechariah received this once in a lifetime privilege and honor, when he walked in, the angel Gabriel appeared to him and told him, your wife, she's old, but we've heard, I've, we've heard your prayers and she's going to give birth. Zechariah didn't respond the way I think the angel had wanted and he had doubts. He, he wasn't sure that he could believe it. So the angel Gabriel told him, I am Gabriel, the angel who stands in the presence of God. And because of Zechariah's lack of belief, he takes away his ability to speak. So for the next nine months from that point, uh, Zechariah couldn't speak. And it wouldn't be until John is born, when everybody is with, uh, with uh, Elizabeth and they're talking about the name. What are you going to name this child? Well, um, they said, shouldn't you name him after the father, after a relative? And Elizabeth says, no, we're going to name him John, just like the angel said. And the people were saying, but Zechariah, what do you think? You know, do some sign language. Tell us what you think. And it was at that moment that Zechariah could speak again. And he says, we're going to name him John. He, he wrote it down. His name shall be John. And God gave him his ability to speak. And so John uh, is born and his name means gift of grace or a gracious one. And when you think about John, there's not much in the Bible about his youth, at least not in the, in, in the Bible, the scriptures we have in the 66 books. We don't learn much about it. I'm going to be a bit subjective now and just follow with me. So his parents are old. The next thing that we hear about is when Jesus is, is, is starting his ministry and so is John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is in the desert and he's eating locusts, wild honey. He's, he's dressed uh, very unique in animal skins and, and people see him as a very awkward and odd figure very boisterous, very opinionated. And when you, when you see him out there, you're wondering, what happened to this kid? He, he was a son of a priestly family. He was living in a Jerusalem. Now, the next thing we know, he's in the desert and he's eating bugs. What happened? Here's what I think happened. I think that uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth, because of their old age, they simply passed away. For whatever reason, they passed away. And John would have been young still and very impressionable. And just outside of Jerusalem, just across the desert, there was a community called Qumran. And there was a group of people called the Essenes. The Essenes were a group of majority men who did not marry, and they had abandoned the temple, they had abandoned Jerusalem, because they believed that, um, that they were not pure, and they weren't following God's laws. And so they didn't want anything to do with the temple or Jerusalem, and they went to this, the, this society, uh, or, or this monastery, you, all, you might even call it, of people who were focusing in on baptism, on preparing for the return of God, uh, just living lives of purity. They would read scripture, study scripture, copy scripture. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, if you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, I really think it was the Essenes 
who were copying all those scriptures, and when the Romans came to attack, they hid them in the caves that we would eventually find later on in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls. But this community was known for adopting young boys. They didn't believe in marriage, so the only way they could keep their group going was adopting young boys who could still be taught, who were still impressionable, who would accept their teaching. And I think that if uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth had passed away, John would have been a prime target for them. They would have taken him and they would have taught him their ways. And, and I think the reason that we see him being such an odd figure is because of what he learned. The Essenes left behind all sorts of teachings, not just about scripture, but about the life of their community. And, and the things that we see in John's lifestyle, it's, it's, it comes from that. He was really devoted to a life of purity. He was out there in the desert focusing in on God. And so what we do know <clears throat> is that he was preaching a message. He was preaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. God is coming. He was being that herald in the spirit of Elijah. And when you think about him being out in the desert, this is my opinion. I think that he was trained in the Qumran society by the Essenes, but there was something in his heart that wouldn't allow him to stick to an ascetic lifestyle, which means they wanted to stay apart from everyone. In the spirit of Elijah, John leaves the Essenes because he doesn't want to just be stuck in their group away from people. He needed to go preach. He needed to talk to people to bring their hearts back to God. And so he goes out into the desert. He's living there and we find him in the Jordan River and he's preaching powerful words so that people would repent and come to know God. One, one scene in the scriptures says that John was in the River Jordan and all of a sudden Pharisees and Sadducees came by and John picks them out and he says, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? And so he was very, very powerful in preaching and teaching. And those that would respond to the message of repentance, he would baptize in the River Jordan. One day, the Bible says that even though John's ministry was huge, he recognized one figure that came alongside of the Jordan, his relative Jesus. Jesus had been working with a small group of disciples. His ministry wasn't yet known. It hadn't begun yet. John's ministry was known. But John sees him and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John was doing what he was supposed to in the spirit of Elijah, preparing the way for Jesus. So Jesus walks out into the river with John the Baptist. And he tells John, I need you to baptize me. John was confused by this because he's thinking to himself, why would I baptize you when you should be baptizing me? John recognized something that we should know about baptism. Baptism is not a ritual. It's not a rite. Baptism is a declaration of a specific truth that we need to die to self and be born again to God. So when John would pre preach repentance, the word repentance means change your mind. Change your mind about who God is and who you are and the nature of your relationship. So Jesus came out and he says, John, I need you to baptize me. I, I, I need you to take me through the, the symbolism of, bapti of, of baptism, which means I'm going to die to self. And, and John's like, Jesus, you're you're sinless. You don't deserve to die. There's nothing for you to repent of. But Jesus convinces him and he says, listen, let's do this to fulfill all righteousness. So John the Baptist agrees. And the moment that Jesus is dunked under the water, symbolizing death, and then he comes up out of the water, symbolizing new life. The Bible says that the heavens opened up. And a dove descended from heaven, which is the Holy Spirit, and God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God was happy with what had just happened. This was the amazing beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ, and it began with John the Baptist. So John would go on preaching these powerful messages, which eventually got him trouble, got him in trouble with 
King Herod, and he was arrested and taken to prison. After being in prison for who knows how long, John begins to have doubts, and he's wondering, you know, if I'm a preacher of, of righteousness, if, if I'm God's man, then why am I in prison? And he begins to second-guess himself, and he sends his messengers to speak to Jesus, and he says, ask him, is he the one we've been waiting for, or should we wait for another? This was a moment of doubt for John the Baptist, but Jesus responds and gives him affirmation that yes, he is the one that he's been waiting for. And, and Jesus does not hold that against John. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us later in life that um, Jesus said that among those born of women, uh, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. That's Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. So when you think about this, Jesus appreciated John the Baptist's ministry. He saw what he did as being great and powerful and important. So the question I have to ask now is, how might have John the Baptist impacted Jesus? I know they were relatives, but how did that really affect Jesus? Two things that I have to suggest to you. Number one, I really think that when John the Baptist separated from the Essenes, he didn't want to be like the Sadducees and the Pharisees that are inward focused. And he didn't want to be like the ascetic lifestyle people of the Essenes who were self-focused. He wanted to go to the people. He wanted to go to the poor, to the rich, to the great, to the small, and preach a message of evangelistic power. And, and I think Jesus would have watched that ministry, and it may have affected in how he reached out to people, because Jesus also preached repentance. He also went to the people. The second thing that I really believe that John would have done is he would have, he would have really capitalized on this repentance part, the changing of a person's mind. Jesus in his ministry, he consistently challenged the beliefs of God and he helped people to see God in a different light. And just like everyone thought John the Baptist is weird, he's strange, he's awkward, you know that's what they thought of Jesus too. He was challenging what everyone thought was normal. And so we're grateful for John the Baptist, the herald, the one who announced the coming of Jesus Christ. And as you think about it, maybe we ought to learn a lesson from this also. Both John the Baptist and Jesus taught us that we're not supposed to belong to a small group that simply looks and takes care of itself, but we need to look outside of ourselves and begin to look at our world and ask, who are the least and the last of these? Who are the people that need to hear this amazing message of Advent? that the King is coming and we need to help prepare the way. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this little study and we're going to continue on with the life of Christ. But remember, I'm always pulling for you. So what do you think? If you enjoyed this video, then make sure you click on the like button below and leave me a comment. And make sure to subscribe for even more amazing content. And remember, I'm always pulling for you.